we're taking a good, hard look at Jesus Christ, and that's never a bad thing. <laughs> In fact, uh, you can't do anything of greater significance on this earth than to cast your eyes and your mind and your thoughts on Jesus. That is the greatest work that you could possibly do in your life. And so I invite you into the message this morning to do work. Let's do work. Let's, let's fix our eyes on him. And I'm, I'm, I love the Old Testament. There's a great little story in the Old Testament, a picture of things to come, where uh, the, the Israelites were dealing with a snake problem. You ever had a snake problem? I'm talking about the devil. Yeah, I got a snake problem. How many of you had a real snake problem? If there's a snake, I got a problem. That's, that's how I deal with my snake problem. I don't even like, if the, I have had a snake problem at the zoo before, just because they're there. I mean, I, I don't like them. But uh, I'm talking about the devil. How many of you have had a snake problem like that? And man, Israel was having a snake problem in more ways than one. It wasn't just the devil, but it was physical snake inf infestation as well. And uh, God said, hey, listen, just, just make an make a image of, of a serpent of, of grass and, and raise it up. And tell the people to look and live. Look and live. And if they'll just look, they can, they can be healed from the poison coursing through their veins. They can, they can find hope and help. You say, what is the point of all that? The point of that is looking toward greater than an imagery, a son of God, a savior, risen and coming again, high and lifted up. And if you want to live a life worth living, you're going to have to look at him. Look to live and I'm not just talking about salvation I am talking about salvation but not just salvation if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior you don't need to look away yet fix your eyes on him if you don't know Jesus as your Savior have I got wonderful news for you you can look his way because he's already looked yours he is calling you this morning and so that's the message of our church it's not just the message for this morning it's the message of who we are as a people and who, who we will be no matter what uh, the church body looks like. As a, as a Christian, you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is inseparable and inseverable. It cannot be severed. And, and we praise God for that. Here's what we're doing in this study. If you haven't been with us, I highly, highly, highly recommend, not because I was the one speaking, but because of the journey I feel like many of you are going on. I have had possibly more feedback from this series than I've had on almost anything we've done all year long. And we, we've had a lot of feedback this year. And, and here's what I think's happening. I think you took seriously my plea at the beginning of the series to consider if there's more of Jesus to know than you already know. And uh, Rick, I see a lot of people fanning. Can you, can you adjust the air? I don't see Ivan in here, but uh, just kick it down a degree or two. And when I see you doing this, I'll know we got it right, okay? So uh, I do see, uh, it, usually one doesn't make my mind up, but uh, like 10 of you are, are and, and honestly, I'm wishing you'd sit near me and do that right now. So praise the Lord. Um, here, here's the deal. I, yeah, we're getting them. Great. They're in the front, which is a great place to put a thermostat in the church because everybody gets to watch Kristen do this. That's great. Okay. Um, <coughs> here's, here's, what, here's what we're doing in this study. We are inviting you into a better look at Jesus than you might already have. And how many of you know that if you could take one iota step further with Jesus, it's better? It never gets worse. It never, you never learn too much. You never get too comfortable with him. You never get too close. You ever had a friend you got too close? That wasn't Jesus. I mean, it can happen uh, on earth with, with, with people, but it doesn't happen with Jesus. So I'm going to invite you into this. And here's what our, our kind of journey of this series is. We took a real good look at what I would call Jesus' best earthly friend. John, John the Beloved, literally, uh, if, it was, if it was current day with texting, it would be John the BFF, hashtag besties. It would be, I mean, John and Jesus were close, they were tight, they, they knew each other, they were, they were, one of the reasons there's so many Johns named on earth is because of the favor that's fallen on that name John to be a friend of Jesus. And so John is everywhere. In fact, when we don't know the guy's name, we just call him John Doe. I mean, I don't know what his name was, but someone had to love him, so we'll call him John. And uh, we, we, Jesus and John were tight. And so what we're doing in this study, we could go all over the Bible because you understand this entire book is lifting up Jesus. So I don't want you to uh, miss the point of me kind of hanging out in John mostly in this series, and we're going to 
we, we may step away from John at some point in the series, but we've been hunkered down in the book of John and Revelation, which John also wrote, not to mention 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which we've dabbled in just, uh, just uh, uh, intermittently a verse or two. But we're taking a look at John because the idea is, if you, if you were here the first week, that's what you need to go back and listen to if you weren't, it, that John and Jesus had a wonderful relationship on earth. And then at the, Jesus died, was buried, rose again, ascended to heaven, and John's still living. And some 60, 70 years later, John's still living, missing his friend Jesus. And then there's this moment that happens on the Isle of Patmos where he gets to see Jesus again through a vision. And, and you can imagine him being excited to see his friend again. And if you were here, when he turns around, he sees something he does not recognize as his friend, though he knows it's Jesus. And that is the point of this entire series. No matter how well you could know Jesus, there's always more of him to know. And it is more, more powerful, and I'll use a good Nebo word, it's more better. <laughs> and when you get to know Jesus, it's, it's a good thing. And so uh, that's what we're doing in this. So what we're doing now, I've kind of spent, I was going to just spend one week, and then I thought, I'm going to spend one more week wetting your appetite. I hope now, after the last two Sundays we've had, you are ready. Say, so get to it, preacher. I want to know more of him, if there's more of him to know, okay? So we're going to start with Jesus as Savior. Now, this is what John already knew, and that's why we're going to spend most of our time in the book of John, not Revelation. Revelation was the revealing of the Jesus God uh, that John didn't know, okay? So we're going back to the, John, the, the Jesus that John did know. In John 3, 16, you know this verse, but if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn there. We're going to put it on the screen. We're going to read several verses past this very famous verse, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, or another verse says his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life now look at the next verse this is important for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him as we keep reading verse 18 goes on whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of god's one and only son Verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Verse 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Many Christians have no idea that all that is right after the most famous verse in the Bible. And what is happening in this most famous of all verses in context is Jesus is saying, here I am, I am God, I love you, and most of you don't want it. Most of you, whether consciously or subconsciously, will only get to know me partially. Because to know me all the way is to shine a light on your evil deeds, and you ain't having it. And the problem is, when you refuse to allow the contrast between who he is and who you are to be ex exampled, exaggerated, and exposed... You no longer can get to know him. And that's why the church is in the state it's in. Of knowing of Jesus, but not knowing him as he is. Now, John had an excuse. John's excuse was Jesus had not yet been revealed. We are without excuse. Jesus has been revealed. We have the book of Revelation. We have the complete Alpha to Omega, the A to Z on Jesus, written in the Bible, and we are without excuse. We have got to, as a church, take seriously the mandate, the call, and the command to know Him as He is. And along with that command is a natural frustration that you're going to feel in this study of lowliness and humility. But do not, do not, do not... Con do not confuse that with condemnation. And Jesus very quickly says, now listen, as, as you find out how much I love you and as you look at me and get to know me, you're going to have a sneaky little snake that comes up and says, oh, he's condemning me. He's, he's trying to point out all my flaws. 
Let me put on some more makeup. Let me put on some more covering. Let me put on some more performance. Let me, let me make sure I don't look dimmed in the light of His glory. I want to perform so that, that, and in that moment, you're doing more to not know Christ, and that's the problem with the church. And that's what we're going to battle with this morning. That's what we're going to war with, is the parts of us that hinder us from knowing Him. The parts of us that love darkness rather than light. This week we're going to look at Jesus as Savior. Jesus as Savior. I mean, He's not just a great teacher prophet. He's not just a rabbi. He's not just somebody that, that, that rose from the dead. He is our Savior, your personal Savior. Without Jesus, you are lost and undone. There is no hope of any reconciliation between you and God apart from the work of Jesus Christ. And we know that, but do we know Him? That's the question. So John, in the book of John, gives us several I am statements. You've probably heard of these before. I, I'm not asking you to turn, oh, I've heard a message on the I am statements. Any preacher worth his salt has preached on the I am statements in John. Any preacher boy that has done more than 15 messages has gotten to the I am statements of Jesus Christ. So don't you dare turn me off because you've been down this road before because that's one of the reasons I spent two weeks getting you to the edge of your seat is so that right now you wouldn't disengage. Go, oh, I've heard this one before. Okay, We're going to take a, a look at these I am statements with a desire to not know a fact about him but to actually know him. Right? Isn't it amazing? How many of you uh, can have a favorite sports figure raise your hand it's okay if you do this isn't like a i'm not going to preach against sports in a minute and expose you okay so how many of you have a favorite sports figure okay how many of you right now know roughly how tall they are maybe even their exact measurements how many of you know um how many points they scored in the last game how many of you know where their team how their team is doing right now you're getting a, you, if you're really a sports fan of an individual you know what's going on in fact, if you're a sports fan of an individual and they've changed teams, you've changed teams. And everybody calls you bandwagon. You're like, I'm not bandwagon, I'm bro wagon. I like that guy. Where he goes, I go, right? And so, wait a minute. Honestly, how many of you have spent a large amount of time, quantity time, quality time with your hero? Anybody? That one? Yeah, I know who yours is. <laughs> yeah, it's in the family, buddy. Uh, Jacksonville Jaguar uh, fan back there with a, with a child that plays on the team, grandchild that plays on the team. Yeah, you, you have spent time with yours. And uh, here, here's what I'm saying, though. Isn't it amazing how much you can know about and not really know them? There's a great story about, I think it was Joe DiMaggio. It's before my time, obviously, but... Um, there were some things going on. There was a little boy standing outside the courthouse after the, everybody knows what I'm about to say that knows the story. And he walks out and the little boy looks at him and says, say it ain't so, Joe. Say it ain't so. And here's what that little boy was saying. It's like, I, I, I have revered you. I have cared for you. I have cheered for you. I have followed you. And I didn't know you. You've done some things you shouldn't have done. It is possible to care and be close and never know someone. And the same is true for Jesus. So we're going to take a look at these I am's with a desire and intensity about us to get to know him more. Not to learn factually some things that he is, but to know him as he is. And there is a difference. And so I want to call you into that. John chapter 6, verse 35. I want to read some scripture to you. Then Jesus declared, I am. There it is. Now, let me say this before I go into all these I am's. What's the significance of the way he's verbalizing this? John the writer, and I believe Jesus may have actually said it exactly as he put it into scripture. But if he didn't, John, uh, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, is making sure they all start. He's not saying he is. It gets into the, the context of Jesus saying, I am. He, it would say the same thing as he is, but when, you, when he says it as I am, how many of you know that has an Old Testament ring to it? Jesus is reuniting and establishing himself in his ministry on earth as not a prophet of God, but God himself. And I am was a name that God told Moses to tell 
Pharaoh who sent you. Tell him I am sent you. And so I am isn't just a little language maneuver to get to the fact. It is a joining together of who Jesus is with who God has always been for the religious world that has followed his word to the very beginning stories. God is the I am. And Jesus is saying, as he is, so am I. Remember, John 1, 1 starts, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And later he says, I am my Father are one. And so Jesus says, I am God, the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Verse 48, he says explicitly again, I am the bread of life. Verse 49, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Well, that's kind of a, kind of a how are you? I mean, that got their attention, right? Because they had the I am of the Old Testament as the provider, and he provided. And then Jesus just like flips it on its head and says, and they died. <laughs> and then they're like, oh yeah, I guess they did eventually, you know. Listen to what he says next. Verse 50, but here is the bread. Here, I could see him just pointing to himself because I am the bread. Here is the bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Ew. Right? We had some of that last week, and, and, and they were like, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, ho, ho. It got weird, and everybody was like, ew, that's a hard saying, and they walked away. Jesus is like, no, this is a hard saying, but it's not about munching on my skin. That's not the point he was making. What he was saying is, look, I am God, and God's answer for you that came from heaven like it did in the Old Testament, the manna that came to sustain their life, but they still died. I am now come from heaven so that you never have to die. You must partake of me. You must accept me. You must receive me, listen, as your Savior. Because you cannot have life eternal without Jesus internal. You need to bring him in, you need to accept him in, so that you can have eternal life. And Jesus is making a very clear statement here, but in it, I know you know the facts of it, but I want you to hear the relationship of it. He cares about our hunger and our thirst. You ever been hungry? You ever been thirsty? I'm not talking about for a Snickers and a Coke. I'm talking about when life is rattling you and the needs are overwhelming you and the future is so bleak that you're just so hungry you can't eat. You're so thirsty, nothing satisfies. And Jesus is not just a factual bread of life, bread of heaven no he longs to meet you in your hunger and your thirst i love the song we say even when i don't see it he's working even when i can't feel it he's working let me tell you something in your hungriest moment he's working and his whole point might be this be more hungry I'm going to take that away from you. Be more hungry. I'm going to make this go wrong. Be more hungry. I'm going to send physical pain. Be more hungry. And finally, when you get done with all of your anesthetizing your pain, with everything this world has to offer, every person that seeks for any other fulfillment than Jesus Christ, through the love of Christ, finally gets to a place that they're hungry for something real. They're thirsty for something that satisfies. And Jesus is like, yes, this is what I came for. Get a little more thirsty, get a little more hungry, and look at me and live. It is time for the church not to just know it, but to go through it together. God isn't bringing problems into your life to test you. I don't believe that every time. Sometimes it could be, but I don't believe it every time. God's not bringing problems in your life to, to 
persecute you or to correct you. Sometimes it is corrective problems. I'm not saying it never, but I'm not saying you can't put God's allowance of issues into your life into all the categories correctly and ignore this category. And this category is get a little more hungry. Just get a little more thirsty. And let me tell you what I do in my flesh and without Jesus, when I'm not close and clean and eyes on him, I start trying to fix the problem myself. I start analyzing, I start reading books other than the Bible because I need something practical. I, I want to find an author that's been through something like I've been through. And Jesus says, I have been touched with the feelings of your infirmities. I know your frame. I was tempted in every manner as you are yet without sin. But we don't know Jesus like that. So Jesus is like this unbelievable, unrelatable figure. And Jesus is like, if you knew me, you wouldn't have to find a relatable author. You could come to me. You wouldn't have to follow someone's blog so that you could get some answers for a faith you don't know. You don't have to like it and retweet it and, and hashtag it. You can come into my presence and know me. And man, I want you hungry because, man, when you just want a snack, the world can satisfy. And when you're not really, you ever had that, where you want to go eat, honey? I don't know, I don't really need anything. I just don't know, I don't know. Do you know that's how most people come to church? What you come here for? I don't know. I don't really need anything. I'm just kind of. It's good worship service. It's good to see so and so. What'd you come for? I'll tell you why you didn't get what you needed. You didn't come hungry enough. I'm talking about hungry enough to get something out of a bad message from a lousy preacher. And I promise to deliver on those two points at times. You need to show up hungry and thirsty. And, and that's what he see the the relationship in this fact about him being the bread? Let me give you another one in this little passage. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Now we just roll right past that. Do you know how hard it was to leave that place? Why would God leave that place for maggots such as us? Well, he tells us. I will, at the end of that verse, I will give my flesh for the life of the world. I'm the bread. And yeah, it's going to cost me for you to eat it. But that's why I came. I came to spend and be spent for you. Wow. Have you ever been in a financial crisis and somebody that had means came to you and said, don't think about it again. I have come to be spent for you. How many of you like that right now in a financial situation? Right? right? Well, that means you're hungry for something. I'm not trying to trick you and trap you, but you know what? We don't have to work as a church. Guys, I do. We've just got to get more hungry for money. You came with that built in. I don't have to preach that message. You're hungry for it. I mean, if you went out in the parking lot, there's a $100 bill on the ground, you wouldn't go, I'm full. It's a nice parking lot, and it was a good day. Don't need that. Because all of us are hungry enough for money to go, I tried to check to see if it was anybody's. I didn't see nobody around. You need to come to church and get some Jesus for you. I, I mean, get some Jesus, even if it was meant for someone else, pick it up. It, it, there's enough Jesus for you. Get, get, can I say this? This sounds so wrong. Get a little greedy for Jesus. Get, you know, doesn't it sound God, wrong when we say that we have a jealous God? But I wish a jealous God would have a greedy church every once in a while. That we would just need more of God because he wants more of you. And we've got to come to a point in our lives that we go, hey, I get who you are when you say you're the bread of life. You're about my hunger. You're about my thirst. You're about my future. You're about my life. It is not about, it is about you being high and holy. But God, you were that before you came. So he didn't come to be high and holy. He came to the lowly. He came for you. And that's the relationship I need you to know about the first I am. The second I am, I'm never going to get through if I take as long as I did on the first one. Amen. I am, this will be a 12-week series. Uh, I am the light 
of the world. He says this in John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How many of you know what it is to hit that dead blamed coffee table in the middle of the night? Say amen if you've hit the coffee table. Say amen if you found the lost Lego. Oh my, is that, I think we could get rid of terrorism if we would just put in, down there in Abu Ghraib Legos around and just make them walk around. They'd be like, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Oh no, no more bombs, no more bombs. I mean, I, if you've ever known what it is to walk in the dark and experience the thing, the, the thing that goes bump in the night is usually me. If you know what that is, here's what you start doing when you get smarter. Jordan, this morning when I woke her up, she said, is there any way I can just get out of bed without having to look into the sun? Drama much? The light in the hallway was on. But see, because of the, the uncomfortable light when we've gotten used to darkness all night, what we do as Christians is we decide to get ready for life in the dark. And we're shocked when our feet are hurting from the Lego infraction and our shins are busted from the coffee table. And, and, we, and God's like this. He says, hey, listen, I got a better way. I am the light of the world. And, and, and let me tell you, I'm not here to say I'm the light of the world so everybody all eyes on me. Yeah, I'm Jesus. That's not the attitude. He was holy and worshipped as he was supposed to be worshipped before he ever left heaven to come down here. This isn't about all eyes on me, all lights on me. He's not some rap star trying to get everybody doing his, hey, say my name, say my name. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this, not so you could be in awe of my light, but so that I can light up your dark. Do you see it's still about you? If you knew Jesus as he is, you would know he is crazy about you. He left heaven's splendor for you. He came to save you from you. And the church doesn't know that. That's why we're not sure we want to tell our friends about him. Because it's still about what they'll think of us. If we would love the people of this community like Jesus loves us, it would waken us to a voice to those people for an answer for this community. But here's the problem. We neither love the people like Jesus loves us because we don't know how much Jesus loves us. So we're actually being honest in our silence. And we must confess and repent of not knowing him because if you knew him like I know him you would tell someone else about him that's the point that John was making in the book of John he is the bread of life he is the light of the world Jesus said this he said hey 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 let me tell you thirdly John chapter 10 verse 7 therefore Jesus said again very truly I tell you I am the gate for the sheep Woo! Y'all need to know you're supposed to be excited right there because you're like, why does the sheep need a gate? Here, here's, this is a hard one to teach because I really need to combine the next one with it to kind of try to get it all together. Can I do that? Will you be patient with me? I am the gate. Let me read the next verse uh, that we have, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let me read the next one to you because they kind of go hand in hand. His next I am is found in the same chapter, John chapter 10, the next verse after chapter, uh, verse 10, and, and it's this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So, <laughs> this is why it's hard to explain. Because he's like, I am the gate for the sheep. Now, if you go back into Jerusalem, and those of us that went to the Holy Land, if you may remember seeing the sheep gate. And when you see the sheep gate, here's why it's called the sheep gate, because that's where they brought the sheep into town. Sheep notoriously aren't supposed to be in town, right? Sheep are out in the fields. But they would bring the sheep. Now, let me tell you what the sheep didn't know. The sheep didn't know why they were going into town. And it wasn't to make wool, because that's altogether survivable for sheep. 
the sheep were going in to make sacrifice for the sins of the people. Get, can I just take you into Bob's scary mind for a minute? This, I'm not preaching now. I'm just musing a little bit. We're going to become the smartest sheep that ever lived because I hear they're not really that intelligent. But this one's having thoughts as he's coming into town. And here's how he's thinking. Man, this is nice. I mean, this is awesome. Who built this? I mean, I think there's more than, than just being a shepherd. I mean, if the other humans built this, they're way more qualified than the guy that's been watching us. This is impressive. <laughs> and as he comes, he starts getting the smells and the sights and the sounds. And he's like, oh, I haven't even been living yet. This is where it's at. Kind of like you were when you first came to church. <laughs> this is great. Man, I'm going to get to know these people so well. It's going to be it's going to be close, and it's no more worrying about wolves. I mean, the, the wolves are scared to come in here. Look at all these people. And they're, they're, like, they're, like, they're looking at me with affinity. They're like, we're glad you're here. Boy, are they glad he's here. Because he's about to pay for their sin. So Jesus is like the gate for the sheep. It sounds lovely unless you're a sheep. And Jesus is, says, hey, listen, I, I, I'm going to show you how to sacrifice because I know how to sacrifice. You ever felt like a sacrificial lamb? Isn't it funny how many of us pray this prayer, Lord, use me. And the second we get used, we feel like a sacrificial lamb and we start going, this stinks. Jesus says, hey, I know all about it. I'm the gate for the sheep. Right this way. Right this way. Then he goes a step further and he says this. He says, I'm the good shepherd. Again, I, theologians might beat me up for this, but it's just us here, right? So the sheep's like, yeah, all right, this is nice. Then he gets bled out and dies. And Jesus is like, hey, sheep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become the gate. I'm going to walk through the gate. And I'm going to take your place. And in this part of the illustration... We stop being the ones that receive a sheep's blood for our sin. And we start to see God's blood forever cover our sin. And, and it's very important that God w walks this out together because he says, I don't just take the sheep's place of sacrifice, which he did for us, but I am their shepherd and I'm a good one. And here's what good shepherds do. They lay their life down for the sheep. Never again do we fear walking amongst men because it's not about what's going to happen to us. It already happened to him. Why is the church so scared of this world? Because we're pretty sure Jesus isn't really honest and he's going to let us die again. And we're scared to bleed. And so we run. And we silence ourselves. And Jesus says, I'd like you to know me. If you feel like a sheep or if you feel in need of a sheep, I'm both. I will sacrifice myself for you, for you. <laughs> Whichever side you feel like you're on. Hey, preacher, you feel like you're being used? I'll do it for you. Hey, staff member, you feel like you're being used? Jesus says, I'll do it for you. Hey, hey, church member, volunteer, feel like, you, feel like we just want you for your trunk and your candy? Feeling that way right now, isn't it? It's hard to act like you don't have a trunk. Right? Y'all walking into church like, I ain't got no trunk. You got a trunk, we saw it out there. Boy, they're getting vicious about it. Last week it was two, now it's just 18. 16 people are like, we're going to do this, and we're still going, we want more. It's okay. You know why? One of the greatest attended events of our community. There's going to be a ton of kids there. There's going to be a ton of people there. And you know what's really a bummer? Trick or treat, trick or treat, trick or treat. That was good, Mom. <laughs> they want a bunch. And we want them to be there long enough to love on them. And we want to be nice to them. And we want to get to know them. And we want to befriend them. You say, what's the point? What's the point? We're just using you. 
That's the point. Well, I'll be glad when they call me for something that doesn't cost me anything. Yeah, well, Jesus took care of that part of it too. He's the gate and he's the sacrifice. Now that I've guilted you into a trunk, that was not the point that I meant to do. So that's that, that, it's not even in the notes, I promise. I'm going to omit that whole thing because of how I feel right now. I'm going to omit that from the second service. You should have come to the second one. Okay. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Let me move on. Oh, by the way, can I show you something he says? And, and this is just good for us to know in this. Uh, uh, verse number 12, he goes on. Let me show you the difference between me and the hired hand. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. This is Jesus, not me. This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, I'm a good shepherd, not a hired hand, because he doesn't own the sheep. I bought you sheep with my blood. There's a great verse that says, what? No, you're not, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. So Jesus is like, I bought you. I own you. I'm not a hired hand. I am a loving owner shepherd. So when he sees a wolf coming, the hired hand abandons the sheep. He's like, oh, snap. And he gets out because a wolf, I mean, they ain't my sheep. I mean, I can do without a day's pay. I can't do without a limb. <laughs> I can't do with a blood sport, so they're gone. He abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Now, I'm going to tell you who won't do that, and this is why you need to know him this way. Jesus is not someone you hire on the weekends to make you feel better about that messed up life you got. If you're coming to church that way, you need to stop tipping Jesus and paying him and hiring him instead of an $800 an hour counselor. That's not what church is. Here's what the Savior of the world, the good shepherd wants you to know. The next verse. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am amazed. I, I am absolutely amazed. One of the things that happens when, you, when, you, when God gives you a church that goes and grows and people start talking. By the way, it always looks better from the outside looking in, right? Can we just say that? Like we're here, we're like, oh no, but they're great. Well, other people think it's phenomenal. Don't tell them. But here's what happens. The phone starts ringing from other pastors. And, and, and I'm not, I know what God did. My wife knows what God did by putting us into this pastorate. It, it, was, it was not a career move. It was not a, a, something we'd always been wanting to do. It, it was literally God doing what we didn't even understand. And if you were here, I, see, I just saw some people nodding that were here. And you know. If you were here, and especially if you were, weren't just here, but you were here and involved, you know, it, it, was, it was a God thing. It amazes me the more I talk to other pastors, how little they care for the sheep. I mean, oh, I'd love the church if it didn't have so many people in it. And man, you know, tell you what, preacher, can I ask you a question? How much are they paying you over there? Because I don't feel appreciated at my, my church. And, 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 and how, do you, how do you teach your sheep how to give you more and take better care of God's man? You'd be shocked. These are like the top, they're in the top five questions I get as a pastor. And I read this and I'm like, you're a hired hand, bro. Because It seems like you care nothing for the sheep, and you should let. And, and by the way, I kind of hope you won't, but you can test me on this. In fact, you don't even know the number of times this may or may not have happened this way. But I'm not here for the paycheck. I'm not here for the accolades. I'm not here for the fame. I'm not. I promise you, I'm not. One could argue I had some of that prior to coming here in larger numbers. Paycheck, not so much, but, but everything else. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. When God does it, and this is why you need to start seeing and knowing the difference. This isn't about me. This is about the verse. But I'm trying to say I can understand in a way maybe you don't when you read it because of the position I hold. Here's what Jesus is saying to you. He's saying, hey, I don't want you just to hear I'm a good shepherd compared to the other shepherds. I don't want you just to hear this factual stuff. I want you to understand I left heaven's glory to come down onto this earth, not for the pay. 
I came down to this earth not so that you could all gather around when I feed 5,000 and say I'm the man, but so that I could get to the ultimate event in my life where most of you would walk away and deny you ever knew me. I came for the right reasons, Jesus says. And we as a church, all eyes off me at this moment, because I, I hate the way that kind of came across. I was trying to say I understand something in this that the church needs to understand. And what Jesus is saying here is this. I didn't get paid to do this. If I did, when the wolves come to the Garden of Gethsemane in a few months, I'd be gone. But I'm going to lay my life down even in the tough times. I'm going to find a way through. I'm going to walk like I came for you, not like I came for myself. That's what Jesus is saying here. And if you know him that way, when the times get tough, you can lean into your shepherd and not wonder if he's leaving. And I would humbly love to be that same feeling for you. I want to say for those of you that were worried when Anthony sat up here and said, Bob's taking a two-month sabbatical, and a couple of you said, are they getting rid of him and all this? I, I'm not scolding. I'm saying, I told you. I'm not leaving. And I, I told you then, and you didn't know, and I get it. But now, you know what? Yeah, there were some tough times. Yeah, there was some soul-wrenching stuff going on inside of me. Yeah, it would have been easier to quit and walk away on paper. But let me tell you something. I got to where the disciples get to, and Peter looked at Jesus and said, where would we go? You have the words of life. Where would we go? We're not going anywhere. When it gets tough, we're leaning into you because you're a good shepherd. And you're not going to run away, though the wolves are all around me. You're not going to leave me. And that is the Jesus you need to know. Turns out it's the Jesus I needed to know. Here's how bad the church is doing. We're not even doing as good as John was doing before the revealed word came because we don't know the good shepherd like that. And I fall guilty before you, not knowing before you. I'm just calling you into new revelation of the old, can I say the old Jesus of the, of the New Testament before the revelation? If you weren't here the last two weeks, you don't have a clue what I just said, but I meant it well. I am the resurrection of the life is what he says next. John eleven twenty three. 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. This is Martha and Lazarus was dead. And Jesus said to, to Martha, your brother's going to rise again. And here's what she said. Martha answered, verse 24, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Here's what she, she knew Jesus. She loved Jesus. And Jesus is telling her, I'm about to bring your brother out of the grave right now. And she's like, I know, I know you. And one day he's going to in the resurrection of the day. I know. I know you. And, and, and he's like, you're about to know me like you don't know me. Because when I say Lazarus come forth, the only reason I'm saying Lazarus is because I don't want them all to come out. I got that much power. I could raise everyone that's ever died before. I got to be a little specific here. So you don't know me, Martha. <laughs> you don't know me, but you're going to know me in a second a little better. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he died. Hey, listen, here's what Jesus is saying. I want you to know me. Even if what you think you're going through is going to kill you, you're going to be closer to me in that too. You can't help but get closer to Jesus because he's drawing you closer and closer. And if he has to, he'll do it by way of death. But I love the fact he didn't say, I am the resurrection and the death. He's like, I'm the resurrection and the life. You can live, man. You can have a life like you never knew if you would let me be who I really want to be and who I really am in your life. I am the resurrection and life. Let me give you this. Two more. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And I love what Jesus said in verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can I, can I break this down for you? Thomas is saying, God, we don't know where to go. We don't know the way to go. You ever been there? I don't know what decision to make. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fix this. And Jesus is like, I am the fix. I am what to say. I am the way. In other words, Jesus is saying this. 
Here's the answer to every problem in your life. Know me more. You got a problem in your marriage? Lean into Jesus. Well, preacher, I just feel like I need to get her heart. Bro, you can't get your own heart. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But I tell you, who knows the heart and looks on the heart? His name is Jesus. And if you keep pursuing the other side of the relationship in relational problems, you might miss the heart altogether. And some of the worst marriages I've ever seen have caught each other completely. And it's a flesh bath. And it's torment for years. Bro, you don't want to catch her like that. And sis, you don't want none of him like that. Hurt people hurt people. And since you're both hurt right now, why don't you get to the healer? And why don't you focus on him? And the way will come from him. Last thing. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener, or the husbandman. Verse 2, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Listen to this. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Then he says again in verse 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, by the way, you know what that means? There's an if. That means you can know him and not remain in him. You can know of him and not know him relationally. But if you'll take the time to know me as I am, and you'll know me as I've described myself in all these I am's, Jesus is saying this, if you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Oh, and by the way, apart from me, you can do nothing. So here's kind of, let me make sure you understand what Jesus is saying here as clear as I can. Jesus is like, I hope you'll come with me because I'll I'll help you bear fruit. I hope you'll remain in me because we will bear fruit. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Alpha, omega, the completeness of who God is. Listen to me. This is very important as we move forward in this study. It's all or nothing. Can I talk to the church for a minute? Because we got, we got big plans. We got big hopes and big dreams for this community. We got a big answer that this community needs. Let, let me get your attention. It's all or nothing. We, we did a, a capital program. It may have hurt us. We named it All In. As if that was the hard part. Well, we were all in. We raised, we, 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 we raised a, a mountain and it all came in. I mean, we got there. Can I tell you how undependent God is on money? Maybe this will help you. Can I tell you how unimpressed he is by money? The streets are paved with gold. He's, he, he was over it before he got here. Here's what I want you to understand. I'm not not besmirching the capital program. I'm not besmirching those that sacrificed and gave at all. In fact, if you gave the right way, this is going to land on you perfectly because you're going to understand what I'm saying. If you gave the wrong way, I might hurt you, and I don't mean to hurt you this morning. hope you gave the right way. But here's, here's what I want to tell you. God's like, there's so much more than your financial sacrifice for me. I want you to know me all the way from alpha to omega as I am. And if you don't, you can do nothing. you don't you could do nothing we can build a building we can create programs we can put on events that people will attend we can, can dare I say this we can build a church without knowing him we can get a crowd we can make budget 
we can have people in the community say, wow, what a church. But listen to me. That is nothing compared to what we could do if we would know him as we should. It's nothing. And then, damn it. I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing nothing. It consumes me at night. It, it ravages me at night. I'm not, I'm not anybody special. Some of you have the same drive and the same pulsating beat in your heart that I have. You've, you've not just bought into the vision. You might have had it and that's why you knew this was the church for you because you had it years ago before you ever even knew this place existed and you're just excited because you get to worship at a place that you're that type of person. Then you get this. Let me tell you something. If that beats in your chest, like it, I think it's supposed to beat in every American that's ever lived in this wonderful experiment called America. There's supposed to be something inside of us that drives us beyond the masses of the world that wasn't founded on a Judea Christian faith. There's supposed to be something in us that says, I want to do something of significance for something bigger than myself. And if that's going on inside of you, then Jesus, you need to hear this while you're on the edge of your seat trying to know him. If you don't know him completely, you can't do nothing. Nothing. And, and to someone like you and someone like me, that word nothing rings like a, like a gong that hurts every fiber of your being. I don't want to do nothing for a God that did so much for me. So church, I'm going to say this real clear. More than this place needs your money, we need you to know Jesus. More than we need a building. We, we could change this community from a tent if Jesus was lifted. We don't need a building. We don't need money. We don't need your volunteers. And we don't listen to all you gifted people. We don't need your gifting. Man, Jesus has just wrecked me by saying how unimpressed he is with my gifting. Wrecked me. And he's not that impressed with yours either. And I'm not saying that like a slap in the face. I'm saying that like a plea. Come join me. There's so much more than what he's gifted us with. I told my staff a few weeks ago. i got to end this. I told the staff a few weeks ago. You know why you're gifted? So you don't have to spend all your time doing that. We do something weird with our gifting. We put our whole life around it. God actually gifted you so it could be something you spend a little bit of time on and get great results. And so I challenge our staff, just work on the things you're not good at. Work on the things that don't come easy for you. And then you start to grow and become more complete. God has just wrecked me with that one. That's a whole other sermon series because y'all are like, I don't think that's good. <laughs> You're looking at me like, no, no, you got to do your gifting. No, you got to give God your gifting, but you don't live a life chasing your gifting. You let him complete you. All right, that's free of another short series. And that's going to get omitted too because it just I saw your face and shook. I love you church we've got to know him more every head bowed every eye closed God you're not just the way maker beautiful savior God you're not just a bunch of things we could sing about you're the shepherd that goes deeper you're the vine that brings us sustenance you're the beginning and the end of the whole story you're everything and to know you is to know God as he is Lord I pray that you would be with this church this at this time if you're here this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed if, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior there's no doubt about it you know him as your Savior what we preached on this morning would you slip your hand up I know him he is my Savior hallelujah I wonder if there's someone in here that would say, Preacher, with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking but myself, please bring me respect, someone that would like to communicate with me here for just a second. I wonder if there's someone in the room that would say, Preacher, I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. I don't know him that way. I won't embarrass you, but would you slip your hand up? Just, Preacher, I don't know him that way. Pray for me. Is there one? Is there one? Unless I missed a hand that was raised, this, this room is given a testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. And so here's what I want to say to you. Everything I said about him this morning is still for you. 
It's not just to be saved, but it's for living. It's for life. It's for future. It's for growth. And it's for this community through you from him. And that's what this church is about.